Would you please stand at the reading of the gospel lesson? Our gospel comes from Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 20, reading in Christ's name. <clears throat> in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord showed around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find, find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those who, with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard were wondering at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated. Christmas is always a special time, and it's, as a pastor, I know that I'm supposed to think this way, but I do. <laughs> I never get tired of hearing the gospel message. I never get tired of reading that section of scripture. In fact, each year it kind of grows in its intensity and that spark that God had placed in my heart. But it wasn't always that way. When I was a young man, we went to church on a pretty regular basis, and I was confirmed and, and all of those things that are, are normal for, for Lutherans and, and growing up. But for some reason, it just didn't really click with me as a young man, as a teenager. I just kind of went because we were supposed to. And a lot of times, I just kind of went through the motions. But at the age of 24, God did something in my heart that I'll never forget and that I'll never stop praising him for. He sparked an excitement for Jesus in my heart that I never had before. And quite frankly, from that moment at the age of 24 until now, it continually grows brighter and burns hotter. And that's been 30 years now. And even though there's been bad years and good years, and as I was kind of looking back, and I kind of made mention to this last Sunday, where about a year and a half ago, I was really pretty much ready to hang it up. I didn't want to be a pastor anymore. I had been serving in North Minneapolis for almost six years, and I was just done. I didn't want to do it anymore. I just felt I was ineffective, and I was, I'd come to the end of what God had asked me to do. And as God kind of led me to that, well, wonderful reminder <laughs> that he calls us and human beings don't, and how sometimes we kind of allow humans to dictate what we do and what we say for the things of God, God kind of woke me up. But even in the midst of that despair, that time when I wanted to hang it up, that time that I wanted to quit, even in the midst of the worst of that, that Christmas Eve, I still got excited over the gospel. And I remember shedding tears as I read the story because I needed to hear it so much. Because I think that if we can say anything about the last two years, we've experienced a range of emotions. And quite frankly, the, the shepherds also experienced a range of emotions. It's interesting that as the angel appears to the shepherds, they start off with fear, they're moved to wonder, then to curiosity, then to joy and praise. And I, that transition of the shepherds, it really kind of mirrors that of my own life. And I kind of pray that that transition would happen in every single one of our hearts. Now, I'm not saying that everybody that's coming in here is afraid. I hope that's not the case. But maybe there are some anxieties. Maybe there are some worries. 
Maybe there are some things that you just don't know how they're going to turn out because we live in an uncertain world, don't we? We have no idea what's going to really happen tomorrow. But the one thing that we do know is that God is a God who keeps his promises. As we look at our Old Testament lesson in Isaiah chapter 9, here we're told that one would come. And I love how it has like a Trinitarian formula to the text. Mighty God, everlasting Father, wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. Here the great triune God of creation was setting the stage that he was about to establish an eternal kingdom, and the ruler of that eternal kingdom would reign forever and ever. He would rule and reign with the heart of God and the righteousness of God, and he would be indeed the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Again, all of this promise kind of coalesced in the house of David, in King David. But that promise began in the Garden of Eden. As sin entered into the world, and all of us now, being born, are infected with that sinful nature that each one of us is born separated from God. That's why salvation is so crucial. The preaching of the gospel, baptism, the continuing of faith in that baptism, all of those things are so vital to a living, authentic, and genuine faith in the great God who has saved us through Jesus Christ. But God promised to Adam and Eve as sin entered into the world that one would come to crush the head of the serpent, Satan. And hallelujah, that's Jesus. That promise was echoed through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of the Israelite fathers, the patriarchs. It was further focused in King David, and from King David would come the Messiah. The beautiful thing that we see in our text is, yes, Joseph is from the house of David, but so is Mary. And so both Mary and Joseph are from the house of David, and so you have this incredible promise being fulfilled in a teenage girl and a man who, I don't know how confused he was or not, but I'm telling you, I would love to have a conversation with Joseph. Because as he met the woman he wanted to marry, he finds out she's pregnant before they got married. An angel comes to him and says, you get married to her anyway. And then all of these wonderful and miraculous things happen. I think sometimes we kind of lose the miraculous nature of Christmas, and quite frankly, I think that consumerism kind of gets in the way. We're so busy buying presents and getting cards and, and getting this for that person, and I think sometimes we, we spend more time pleasing other people than we do the Lord. Now, I know it's a special time, and I love to be around family in this time, but Christ is really the meaning in Christmas. Jesus is the reason for the season. Because it talks about this government, and what I love about this, it talks about all of the elements of war are going to be done away with, and there will be no more war. Now, of course, that section of Scripture is talking about Christ's second coming. Well, he will come to not only judge the living and the dead, but he will come to bring those who are his home to live with him for all eternity. Can anybody say amen? amen. This world is not our home. There will be no more wars or rumors of wars. There will be no more pandemics. There will be no more catastrophes. There will be no more sickness, illness. There will never be another funeral again. And you know what? I'm okay with that. And as we here celebrate the wonderful birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we do so hoping that God installs in us a freshness of what the shepherds experienced. The angel appeared to them and they're afraid. Have you ever been afraid in this life? I have. Have you ever been just so not wanting to go out the front door? <laughs> Am I the only one that feels like I just want to curl up in a ball, stay in bed, and just drool and watch Netflix the whole day? I can't be the only one. But the problems don't go away, do they? But even when we come to church and hear the gospel, the problems don't necessarily go away either, do they? But something else happens. This beautiful exchange happens. Paul talks about this in Philippians where we take our anxieties and our worries and we give them to God in prayer and he exchanges our, our fears, our anxieties and our worries and gives us a peace that surpasses all human understanding as we look to Jesus as the author and the perfecter of our faith. That's not always easy, is it? It's a simple thing, but it's not an easy thing. Trusting in God in difficult circumstances. As the shepherds heard this incredible message, 
their fear turned to curiosity. And I really hope that this transition kind of happens for us too. It's like, let's, let's go see this thing that they talked about. Now, there's a lot of beautiful theological connections with the shepherds in Bethlehem and Jesus being the spotless lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so let's just say the shepherds probably had a little bit more of an insight than most of the other people. They were also kind of viewed as, they weren't really like the scum of society, but they wouldn't be what the elites of society either. Now, I grew up on a farm, so I can say this without doing any type of derogatory statement or being condescending in any way. When you say you're a farmer, when you talk to someone who's like maybe a businessman or someone who's a white-collar worker, they kind of look at you and say, oh, okay. And so shepherds weren't the elite of society. They were humble. They would sleep with their sheep, and their lives were just really dedicated to protecting and, and allowing their sheep to be led to green pastures. And so you can kind of see the connection, this shepherding connection. And that's why the King of David aspect to Jesus is so important too. As Jesus came from the house of David, the two, thing, the one, well, two things that they had in common other than others, David was a good king. He wasn't a really good dad and not a really good husband, but he was a really good king. And the beautiful thing about David that pointed forward to Jesus is that before he became a king, he was a shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. He came, he emptied himself, and he lived the perfect human life that we could not. And he did this because of the extravagant love and grace and mercy that flow from the great God that we serve. Jesus was born in a manger in Bethlehem for you and for me. And I pray that we would never take that for granted and that curiosity would continue to stir as the shepherds did. As the shepherds allowed that curiosity to lead them to Bethlehem and they, as they entered into the place where Jesus lay, they saw Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger and that curiosity turned to wonder as they shared these things with Mary, things Mary already knew and had already heard and accepted, but further confirmation for maybe all those around them, maybe even for Joseph. That this was indeed the promised Messiah. This was indeed the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who was born in the most humble of ways. And as they looked at that baby lying in a manger, and as they shared these things, verse 20 is really the verse I want to end on and the verse that I'd like you to think about these next maybe couple weeks. And the shepherds returned back to their sheep, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. And that's the honor that we have to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I remember as a young man, I'm just going to be honest with you, I'm just like, man, do we got to hear the whole thing again? I mean, I heard it already. You know, is it once enough? And the answer is no. <laughs> because there is nothing that we need more now than the eternal hope that comes through Jesus Christ. The eternal hope that reminds us that this world is not our home. The eternal hope that reminds us that one day when Jesus returns, there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more anguish. We will live in a place for all eternity where death is no more. I don't know about you, but I need to hear that. And even as a pastor, I need to hear it over and over and over. And that's why I get excited. I have the honor of actually pro proclaiming this message to you. And it's so interesting that a year and a half ago, I was ready to just give it up. I'm kind of glad that I didn't. I know not everybody probably feels that way, but I'm so thankful to be serving the Lord on this Christmas evening, to be here proclaiming the saving gospel of Jesus Christ with each one of you, and I pray that more than anything that, that we would be like the shepherds and allow whatever fear that we have, whatever anxieties that we have, whatever, I don't know, thing that's bothering us inside, let those things get melted away in the hope of the gospel. May that all turn into a wonder and a curiosity that leads to seeking Christ in a way that causes us to praise and glorify God because of what Christ has done. Because he is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. He's the greatest gift this universe has ever seen. And he is definitely worth celebrating, worth singing about, worth glorifying and allowing him to birth in us a gratitude and a thankfulness.
for the extravagant love, grace, and mercy that Christ has shown us on the cross of Calvary. May we never take these wonderful gifts for granted, and may we continue to celebrate Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who was born this day in the city of David, the Messiah, who is Christ the Lord. Lord, I thank you for this text, and I thank you for this wonderful reminder of the great love that you love us with. We thank you that we serve a God who keeps his promises. We thank you that we serve a God who is Emmanuel, who is always with us, who will never leave us or forsake us. May we continually be reminded of that reality. Thank you for this time, and we thank you for these words, and I pray all these things in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said,